When I ask you how you see the world, how do you respond? Are you a glass half empty or a glass half full type of person? I think a lot of us believe that this is just simply wired into us. We're just an optimist or a pessimist, and this is partially true. But there is a piece of this that you actually have control over. Today we're going to be talking about how you can rewire your brain to see more of the silver linings and have a more positive outlook on life. Because as the research points out, a lot of this is actually more in our control than we realize. A lot of the research that I'm going to be using today for this argument is from Martin Seligman in his book called Learn Optimism. Just in case you don't make it through the entire rest of this video, whatever reason, although if you stick around, I got something special for you. But if you end up dipping out, I want to give you the biggest gem up front to this whole thing just in case you bounce early on me. But the key to this entire thing is around expectations and believing that things can get better gives you a higher chance of them actually being better even if they can't get better. So what does that even mean? That's what I wanna break down for you. One of Martin Seligman's famous experiences has to do with actually learned hopelessness, which you may have heard about before. And this is pretty much the idea of giving up, that you try enough, it doesn't work out, and you give up. And his entire research now around positive psychology learned hopefulness. The opposite is that simply believing that things may get better has a really dramatic effect on them actually potentially getting better. So let's dive into this. One of the biggest phrases that if I had tattoos, if I got tattoos, I would have put maybe use on my forehead so I didn't forget it was don't believe everything you think. We're in constant conversation with ourselves, whether we realize it or not, you have this internal dialogue going on in your mind and it's called a dialogue more than a monologue because it sounds like there may be two people or maybe more people. The point being, we have control over that voice more than we think. This is where things like meditation come in. Cultivating an awareness that you're speaking to yourself can be incredibly powerful. One of the biggest pieces of this, being able to have a thought and then understanding it's just a thought and not believe it, even though it might sound like it's your voice. It's very clear that the language and the stories that we tell ourselves are incredibly important. And those narratives are often what leads you to believe one thing over another. And we actually have a lot more control over this narrative than I think a lot of us, myself included, even realize. What Seligman points to is that events will happen, but events don't actually have meaning to them, but we personally assign meaning to them, that we are all going through our own kind of virtual reality because we have our own perspective and our previous experience, previous beliefs taints our ideas of whatever the event is and the stories we tell ourselves around these events matters. One of the interesting things about stories is that they actually can explain a lot of our behavior. Our thinking and our patterns of day-to-day -day life are often built around these narratives that we have for ourselves, that we have for our identity, that we have for events. And whether we realize it or not, a lot of these stories are rarely created by us. A lot of these internal narratives that we have were actually given to us. And then we internalized them and took them on as our own stories. A lot of how we see the world, at least in what Seligman argues in terms of pessimism or optimism, comes down to these narratives and a lot of them are ideas and stories that you inherited or were told by parents or teachers. When you were growing up, if you saw a parent handle a situation a certain way, chances are you would see that as an example and then internalize that. Or a parent might tell you that's what it is. We're this type of people, we're not this type of people, right? These stories that start to become crafted and then internalized, whether you realize it or not, are hand-me-downs from your folks. Could be good, could be bad. Same thing for teachers. You might be in a class and you're not exactly knocking it out of the park and your teacher might say, you know what, little Susie, math just isn't your thing. And then you just have that idea and you're like, oh, I'm not a math type of person. And that might seem harmless, but those type of ideas are actually insidious because then we start to believe them. And that's confirmation bias, right? The more you start to believe it, the more you see it. And just that alone, thinking that about yourself will lead to behaviors that then reinforce that belief. And that's why those can be so dangerous. That's why these narratives are so important because a lot of these narratives were given to you where what I'm saying is you actually have a choice now in creating what narratives and stories you actually want to believe. So you might say, okay, Kia, this is sounding cool, but how do I know if I'm an optimist or a pessimist? I just believe what I believe. Is there any way that I can actually figure this out? You know, I got you.
This is what Seligman points to. One of his big differences between optimist and pessimist is explanatory style and the language use. What Seligman argues is that events just happen, period. Whether they're good or bad actually depends on the values that we assign to them and how we explain them. So this is what I'm getting to. The big difference between optimists and pessimists in explanatory style is the language use around permanence. If you tend to have a more negative or less optimistic view of the world, we'll say, a lot of these pessimists will use very permanent language. Things like, this always happens to me. I never get chosen for the cool projects. It's broad. It's always, it's concrete. The difference is optimists will be able to see it as situation specific. Say you work as a consultant or something. It might be like, I lost the biggest client, but I might have a chance to get an even better one next week. That's a very optimistic way to say it compared to I lost the biggest client. I always am messing up at work. Two very different perspectives on the same event. Using a sports example, an optimist might say, okay, I broke my ankle. I was training for a marathon, but I'll be able to hopefully run it even better next year once I get my body in shape. Or I broke my ankle. This will give me more time to train for the next one, right? It's this setting up for the future with kind of a bit of a hedge. It's X, Y, and Z happened, but whereas the, the pessimist, that one, two, three parts kind of left out. It's just, I broke my ankle, this is the worst. It's, you are able to kind of see the upside or the silver lining of this event might actually help you trigger down the line. Now, kind of flipping this on its head, the difference, like we were talking before about the whole thing, macro versus micro, this is where situations, who you are blaming in the situation is very different in language use. A pessimist is going to blame the macro. These are people that like to blame the government, that like to blame the system. You're seeing these kind of reoccurring themes here, right? It's always like blaming something, there's a, there's a hopelessness to it. Seeing these things with a more optimistic lens, you can say, Maybe not the whole system is broken. Maybe I'm getting a bad grade because this one teacher doesn't like me. Maybe this company isn't the best, but maybe it's not the whole company's bad. Maybe I'm just butting heads with this boss, right? You're able to actually really kind of pinpoint more micro, more specifically what the problem might actually be rather than blaming the entire system or macro structure of whatever it is that you're up against. Speaking of blaming, and this one's interesting because I'm going to hedge it at the end afterwards, but a big difference between optimists and pessimists is internal versus external framing and blaming. So what does this mean? This means if you ask somebody out at a bar, they say no, you're going to think that it's because of you, because you were are ugly, because you didn't say the right things, et cetera, et cetera. But the point being, if you have an optimistic perspective, you're going to think of it more as a situation. You might say, yeah, he just might not be ready to date right now. Pessimize, internalize the situation, whereas optimists will externalize the situation. They'll be able to see the situation for what it is, which is circumstance. Here's why I want to caveat this, because sometimes it is your fault, straight up. Don't be the creepy guy who just thinks that every woman just got out of a relationship. If you're being weird, like you're probably just being weird. At the same time, there's a reason sometimes that life will teach you these lessons. So you don't always wanna put the blame off yourself. I think taking that responsibility is super important, but not beating yourself up in having that parade as radical responsibility, I think is also really important too. Understanding the delineation between when it is really you or when it's not. Not surprisingly, there's a lot of research that is showing that pessimism is linked to depression, which makes sense. And there's a whole laundry list of positive things that come if you have a more optimistic perspective. What I want to talk to you about is actually how to do it. I'm not trying to convince you to be optimistic. What I am trying to talk to you about is if you want to be more optimistic, here's how. What Seligman talks about is the ABC technique, adversity, belief, consequence. And you can break things down into this framework. Adversity is the challenging event. This could be a speeding ticket. This could be being rejected, not getting your promotion. Some sort of an event that is going to often trigger an emotional response, not in a good way. This is adversity, something that is going to be challenging. B, the belief. This is what do you actually believe about that situation what's the story you're telling around the situation c is going to be the consequence how do you feel after b happened b is not the feeling b is just the response the story you're telling c is the feeling so let's walk through an example the adversity is you're applying for a new job you call the company you leave a message you don't get a call back two different scenarios adversity you don't get the call back 
B, the belief. You think, I'm just not qualified. I knew this wasn't gonna work. Why am I even applying in the first place? Consequence, you feel crappy about yourself, probably go eat some ice cream, maybe don't apply to any more jobs. That's one event, one kind of thought pattern, linear thought trajectory through A, B, and C. Let's try number two. A, adversity, same event, apply for the job, call, no callback. B might be, maybe they need a little more time. You know what, I'm gonna give it a weekend and then I'm gonna follow up. C, what's the consequence? What do you feel about this, right? It's very clear the difference is here. You think there's still a chance, maybe it's them. Maybe it is you, but you you don't immediately go to it's your fault. You go to all the circumstances around it. This is why the game of telephone is so interesting because the same event, the same person can assign completely opposite stories and perspectives to. That events themselves are neutral. It's the stories we tell around them that are paramount. So to wrap this whole thing up, a lot of this comes down to awareness because you need to be able to see your beliefs as beliefs. You need to be able to have a little bit of that sense of awareness that you are believing things and you are feeling things and to see the stories that you are telling yourself. Because without that, right, you're just on autopilot. That's the whole point of this channel. That's why I'm doing my own self-work is to create more space. And this comes down to one of my favorite quotes by Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl said, between stimulus and response lies a space. And in that space lies our freedom and power to choose a response. And in our response lies our growth and our happiness.